Well, thank you so much, and I want to thank the Santa Barbara Botanical Garden uh, for bestowing this honor on me. Uh, I can't help but think of all the wonderful people out here, uh, out there who are doing conservation work, including all the speakers that we've had this morning and this afternoon. And, and so I'm very sensitive and aware of, of the, the great honor that's being bestowed on me in selecting my work. Um, today, I, I want to talk to you about restoring pollinator communities in California's agricultural landscapes. And as you've heard a number of times today, of course, pollinators are incredibly important for our food supply. And they're also really important for, plant, for creating uh, the evolution of plant diversity and for the reproduction of plants. They're involved in 86% of the, of the plants out there on the planet uh, benefit from animal pollinators um, to, to reproduce. But today, um, I'm going to talk, I'm going to concentrate mostly on their role in our food supply. So I want to start with this curious paradox. We live, especially in this country, in a land of plenty. We actually produce on the planet a lot more food than we even need. Yet, we have about a billion people on the planet that are chronically undernourished, another billion people that don't receive sufficient nutrients. And then a growing problem with obesity. About 800,000 people on the planet are now um, obese, and that, of course, causes other health problems. And in addition, the way that we're producing food is causing a lot of unintended consequences, such as pollution, climate change, biodiversity loss, the evolution of antibiotic resistance, soil loss, oceanic dead zones, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think of this as unhealthy people plus unhealthy planet equals a broken food system. And you might be wondering, whoops, did she get the wrong talk here? We're supposed to be talking about pollinators. So where do the pollinators fit in? And for me, the way it fits in is that it's through studying pollinators that I learned about all of these problems and uh, started to connect the dots myself. So today I want to retrace that story with you and learn from the pollinators about what we can do to get our food, food production system back on a more sustainable track. So let's start by thinking about how important pollinators are in a little bit more detail for our food supply. So this graphic shows that every time you eat that sandwich or breakfast or whatever, you can thank a pollinator for one out of three bites of food. You've probably heard that before. The reason is, is that why is it only one third? It's because we do rely for the caloric content of our diet quite heavily on grains that are wind pollinated and don't require animal pollinators. But then there's a third of you know, all those fruits and vegetables that are um, uh, making up the other third. When we think about the diversity, though, of, of crops that we enjoy, it's about three quarters of the crops that we eat that benefit from animal pollination. And some of the things that we particularly like, like you know, cherries and almonds and, uh, well, maybe butternut squash is not your favorite, but um, it's also important to think that the, uh, the, the, the fruits and vegetables that pollinators contribute to are also very important sources of micronutrients in our diet. They're responsible for a lot of the vitamins A, C, and E. And even if we were to take vitamin supplements, often these are utilizing some of the plants that are pollinated to produce those supplements. So we really depend on pollinators extensively for our own health. This is another type of vitamin C, <laughs> at least for me personally. I really need chocolate, and I think many people do. Um, it is pollinated by a tiny fly, it's a uh, midge, um, and so again, another need for pollinators. <laughs> so it used to be that we farmed in situations that look much like this, with small farm fields surrounded by lots of natural habitat, uh, lots of diversity on the farm field itself, and lots of diversity of native vegetation surrounding the farm field. And in that kind of situation, there really was no need to manage pollinators to bring honeybees to our farm fields. There were plenty of wild pollinators living around the farm field. And here are some of, uh, courtesy of, of Roland Colville, some of these beautiful actors. Uh, often we think mostly of bees when we think about crop pollination. Bees are very, very important for many of our crops, but of course there are also other uh, types of organisms involved as well. I already mentioned midges for chocolate and other things. 
But the situation really changed when we changed our agricultural system towards one that focuses on monoculture. And one of the reasons is that monoculture agriculture creates a really high demand for pollinators all at a moment in time. So for example, this is an almond orchard here in California. We produce about 80% of the world's almonds. Each of those trees has 50 to 100,000 blossoms. And as you can see, and as you probably have seen when you drive up I-5, there are these very large fields that contain many, many trees. They're all blooming at the same time. And as you go up and down uh, California's Central Valley, you'll see them, many, many fields, one after the other, all <coughs> producing of these flowers. And they all need to be visited by a pollinator in order to have fruit set to produce a nut. And so it just can't be done with the native pollinators. We have to bring in an army of pollinators. And the only way to accomplish that is to bring in the um, European honeybee. So each of those colonies of European honeybees could have 30 to 50,000 individuals, and that provides the worker force. The problem is now that we don't have enough of them here in California, so we end up actually bringing them from all across the country. We need to amass about one million colonies every year in California to provide uh, for almond pollination. And sometimes, the, uh, on the way, the colonies are sort of left uh, uh, for a while in, in this kind of barren environment, um, not many flowers around there, they will be brought to the almond field before the flowering starts. And again, if you look at that field, you don't see really any flowers. Uh, so the bees might be hungry. That could be one problem. Um, and also, we have many problems that have also been alluded to during this symposium that uh, you know, when the, uh, around the t after the time that the migratory beekeeping phenomenon started, we had the introduction of a mite uh, called the Varroa mite, not on purpose. Um, it's a pest of the honeybee. It transmits diseases and, other, and causes uh, weakening of the honeybees. Um, and so people started using miticides to try to control the mite. And of course, they had to keep changing these miticides as the mites evolved resistance. And some of the miticides also impose some health impacts on the honeybees. So we get a situation that's not very healthy. And as we've also heard earlier today, um, not long ago in 2006, we had a new phenomenon developing of colony collapse disorder. In this situation, what happens is the bees disappear. So what you see on the top there is a healthy colony, and then below is an unhealthy colony where most of the workers have left but there's still uh, the larval, um, the larvae in there, um, the pupae, and the queen is still there, but, but the workers are all gone. A mysterious phenomenon. Um, it was so important that it actually created some real policy changes. So more funding available for pollinator research, especially for research into the causes of colony collapse disorder <coughs> on the honeybees, but also additional research focused as well on native bee conservation. Uh, a lot of focus was on potential diseases, viruses, um, parasites, and other things of the honeybees. But people began to realize that it wasn't a simple problem, but one that probably has multiple causes and that we still don't understand. So I mentioned already this sort of issue of there can be a real you know, uh, excess of resources at times on these monoculture fields. And it can switch between this feast stage and a famine stage where there's nothing on these fields. That could be one problem, the lack of nutritional resources for honeybees. But there's another issue that's related to monoculture plantings. And that is, of course, if you've set out this monoculture, it's also a feast for the herbivores, the pests that uh, affect that monoculture. And so in order to control those pests, there really is little re recourse except to use pesticides of various forms. And that's because not only is this feast set out for the herbivores, but also there's really no habitat there to support the natural enemies that might have previously controlled those pests. Now, uh, recently, in addition to sort of the typical types of pesticides, um, over the past decade or so, there's been an increasing use of a new form of pesticide called neonicotinoid pesticides, or neonics. <coughs> and these are now often applied on the seed itself and they're applied to things like corn and soy, and so they're used really over vast acreage in the United States. 
One of the factors about these neonicotinoid pesticides is that they're what we think of as systemic. They're water soluble, they're taken up into the plant and expressed throughout all the plant's tissues, including the pollen and nectar. And thus, while they're not targeted, of course, at pollinators, pollinators might pick them up if they visit the plant flowers and collect the pollen and nectar. Uh, they have a um, neuroactive effect. And thus, uh, while they might not outright kill something like a honeybee, they can have these sublethal effects that affect navigation, foraging, learning, and also the immune system. And thus, they might in interfere with the ability of honeybees to get back to their nest. And that might be one of the reasons why we find uh, we don't see piles of, of dead honeybees in front of the nests, like with some other pesticide poisoning. But instead, we just see a disappearance of a lot of the workers that eventually leads to colony collapse. Now, in Europe, they actually recently uh, banned a number of these pesticides uh, because they deemed them an unacceptable high risk to pollinators. And this is a temporary ban, but it's sort of a very big step. And you can see people here uh, thanking uh, the administrators for doing this. Uh, but this has not happened in the United States. Instead. Uh, we have uh, steadily increased their utilization uh, onto various uh, different types of crops. So what have we learned uh, from the honeybee and the honeybee's story? Well, uh, first of all, uh, we have the situation with monoculture. Um, monoculture engenders this high demand for the pollinators <coughs> and leads to this migratory beekeeping phenomenon. At the same time, monoculture engenders the need for pesticides including these neonicotinoid pesticides that might be having negative effects on the pollinators. And so this an intense reliance on just one species of bee, or the honeybee, leads to a situation where it's a very fragile system. We have a weak link, essentially, in the chain from uh, farm to fork. So let's get back to the native bees. Of course, we, we have these managed pollinators, but we also have wild pollinators. What kind of contribution can they make to pollination um, on our farms today? And we've got, I don't think anyone's actually mentioned this, but uh, just in bees alone, it's thought that there's about 20,000 bee species worldwide, um, 1,500 bee species here in California. So that's a lot of pollinators to work with. How many of them actually visit crops? We don't have a precise estimate on that, but recent studies suggest that it's maybe about 10% of the uh, total amount of bees that uh, are out there are contributing to crop pollination. So really a lot of different species. Now, of course, the honeybee is a social species, but many of our, uh, in fact, the majority of our native bee species are solitary species. And I just have this slide in here to indicate the life cycle of a solitary uh, species. So we have one female going out to collect pollen, bring it back to her nest, which could be dug in the ground, for example. Um, she creates a pollen ball, lays an egg on it, and then seals that up. And no more parental care. Bye-bye, baby. Off she goes. And uh, the, um, the larva develops on the pollen ball and then pupates and eventually emerges to start the cycle over. So how about uh, what kind of contribution can these uh, native species make? Well, uh, in one part of the, of the country where I've worked, in New Jersey, we found that the native pollinators are incredibly diverse and abundant, and they're providing w well more than is even needed of all the crop pollination services for the farms there. And it seems that in this part of the world, um, we have a very, again, a very diverse type of landscape. You can see a picture of one of the landscapes there. A lot of fallow fields, a lot of old fields that provide a lot of floral resources. Um, it's not called the Garden State for nothing. Um, and on the fields that we were studying, we also found a great deal of diversity. A lot of different kinds of crops being grown, a lot of uh, uh, flowers, either weed flowers or fle flowers that were intentionally planted. And so in this kind of situation, really have very healthy native bee populations. Um, this actually goes quite well along with what uh, Gretchen showed also in her uh, citizen science data. Um, and we don't have a problem with pollination. Growers here don't need to rent honeybees or bring them in. So let's move over across the country to California. And this might look familiar to you. This is uh, just a, an aerial view in the Central Valley. And you can see these huge fields, again, very homogeneous inside, field after field after field, very little native habitat. 
let's get a closer look onto the field. You see that at this point in time, this is a watermelon field, I think, that um, you know, it's just starting, the watermelons are just starting, but you can see there's just not a flower in sight. Um, when we think about nest uh, conditions for bees, many of which are ground nesting, you know, a lot of our fields, uh, row crop fields, get flooded. Uh, so ground nesting bees are not going to do well there. And then, of course, the final insult um, to add to the injuries here is that a lot of these fields are going to be drenched regularly in a wide variety of different types of pesticides. And we did a little uh, check on how many pesticides were being applied on some of the fields we studied. And we found, on average, in a year, 27 different types of chemicals being applied. That's the average. So it was quite alarming. Um, so this, this is bad, you know, very bad for bee kind of habitat. So what about some other kinds of environments in California? Well, we've looked um, along gradients of, um, from, you know, farms that are really close to natural habitat to farms that are more like in this previous situation that I showed you. And when we have situations like you see in uh, the top graph there, that's an almond orchard that's right next to a nice piece of oak woodland and chaparral habitat. And there we find really, uh, again, very strong, healthy, diverse uh, native bee communities. Um, and we find that they're, in some cases, they're providing all the services that are needed for pollination. Uh, in the situation with almond, we find that farms that are in this situation have higher um, levels of fruit set of almond than far farms that are far away from uh, the natural habitat. And so it seems like the nearby natural habitat, that's one way that we can have our native pollinators and that they can provide this valuable service to us. We've also looked at what about on the farm itself, because of course a grower can't pick up their farm and put it next to a natural habitat. That's not going to work for them. So some of them are just going to be in a situation where they can't get that benefit. But what about if they plant a lot of different types of crops, uh, or if they intentionally plant uh, flowers that are intended to attract pollinators? And we've done a, a wide variety of types of studies on this as well. I'll tell you about some of them in a little more detail later. Uh, but the, the upshot is that, yes, when we, when we look at these very diverse farms, then we find that that floral diversity that can be engendered by having different types of crops and growing flowers specifically for pollinators can substitute for having that natural habitat around the farm field. <coughs> the problem is that in California, that's not what most of our landscapes look like. So this shows uh, Yellow County. Um, let's see if I can get the... Yeah, I think I can get this to work. Um, so Yellow County here um, is this region here in Northern California, uh, right around Davis, which is where Robin lives. And I'm not sure I'm pointing at the right place because I can't see well enough. But um, anyway, so uh, what, we, what this shows here is that it's only in tiny portions of uh, this landscape where you get sort of 100% pollination or close to 100% pollination being provided by the wild bee uh, community and that's like way up here in this valley that's surrounded by natural habitat and some little places down here but most of this which is the central valley here is getting a, just a tiny amount of pollination from native bees it's mostly therefore dependent on the honeybee so that's the problem most of our agriculture is much more uh, intensive however on the more on the, on the good side of this is that when you look at California as a whole, there's still a lot of regions where the agriculture is really quite close to rangelands and other forms of natural habitat. So California is blessed with remaining natural areas near crops. And when we did an economic valuation to essentially assess how much of the value um, of pollination services might be coming from the native pollinators due to this natural habitat effect, we estimated that it actually native bees um, might be contributing as much as a third of the pollination services needed to California crops, and that's worth about $2.4 billion. So it's nothing to sneeze at, even though we could do a lot better. So I've talked about some results that come from uh, my work and from my lab's work, but how does this uh, stack up when we think about studies that have been done elsewhere in the world? And so we teamed up with many other scientists from across the world, brought together studies from 41 crop systems in 19 countries, all continents except 
Antarctica, and you can see those studies there. The red arrow shows the studies, whoops, sorry. Um, the red arrow shows uh, the studies from uh, California, so mostly my lab there, um, but you can see there are studies from around the world. And the exciting uh, thing is really the headline of this paper here, wild pollinators enhance fruit set of crops regardless of honeybee abundance. Well, what does that mean? What that means is that when we brought all this data together from all these studies, we found that, um, that there was a signal um, of the more, the, the greater the visitation rate from uh, wild pollinators, the greater the fruit set. But when we looked at honeybees, greater visitation from honeybees did not translate to greater fruit set for very many studies, actually only 14% of the studies. And that was a surprise to pretty much everyone who was involved in this work. Um, and what it suggests is that actually these native pollinators are a lot more important than we previously thought. So that was one piece that we got out of bringing all this data together. The other exciting thing was that it confirmed some of these specific studies that we've seen, that we've conducted here. So when we brought all the data together, we found that first of all, there's a strong and important signal of uh, the surrounding natural habitat contributing to the diversity and abundance of the native pollinators. But there's an additional effect of, of uh, farms growing multiple types of crops, so polyculture, and yet an additional effect of uh, conducting organic management as opposed to conventional growing that uses pesticides. So all three of these things, the surrounding natural habitat, the polyculture, and the organic agriculture independently contribute to having healthy and robust um, pollinator communities. And so another cool thing is that there's some really neat interactions that we've discovered between honeybees and native pollinators. So it turns out in two cases, both sunflower and also on almond, we find that the, when, the, when there are native pollinators present in the crop field alongside the honeybees, it enhances the e efficacy of the honeybees so that each time that honeybee visits, it's much more likely to contribute to fruit or seed set. In the case of almond, it actually doubles their effectiveness. So all of these things uh, lead to us understanding that these native pollinators are incredibly important in their direct contribution to pollination services, but they're also an, an insurance policy, if you will. Uh, just like, you know, if you're going to invest in um, stocks, most of us don't invest in a single stock. We've all learned that you're supposed to diversify your portfolio, and it's the same thing. When we want to depend on nature, we also need to depend on the diversity, or we need to understand that we want to rely on the diversity of nature, not a single species. So we have all of these thousands of native pollinators that are involved in crop pollination, and then we have the honeybee, an important player, but it's only one species. And it's a species that right now is troubled with many, many problems. So how do we get there? How do we bring back the native pollinators into our farming landscapes? And this is kind of an idyllic view of what I call a diversified farming system. Uh, so a diversified farming system has many different elements to it. It has different types of crops, so we have row crops here, and orchards here, and little mixed garden here. It has um, things that surround the farm field and that can provide habitat, like this hedgerow here, and this riparian buffer, and wetland over here. It has insectary strips, there's a little bit of alyssum right there. Um, and it has different types of fields, like pastures, and uh, natural habitats, and woodlots. And so it has just a lot of vegetative heterogeneity across scales, and that is what is really important for maintaining pollinators in the system, providing them with both nesting habitat and floral resources. So we can think about all these different types of practices that can happen on the farm and around the farm, farm to produce these, uh, like the ones that I've mentioned, polyculture and flowering strips, hedgerows, riparian corridors, nature preserves. All these things across scales influence pollination in a positive way. But one of the things and this is really what was eye-opening for me, was that I realized that a lot of these same techniques also have positive benefits for a lot of other critical inputs to farming. Nutrients, water, soils, pest control, those are the main things that farmers are managing. And if you just kind of look at this image, 
it's a thought or a conceptual model. But, you know, together, all of these techniques that operate across scales here are supporting a lot of the things that growers need to do and permitting a reduced reliance on agrochemicals, that is, re reduced reliance on synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, so fewer environmental and health problems and healthier food. Let's get back to uh, just one technique that my lab is focused on a lot, and that's hedgerow restoration. So we've been working on this actually for nine years. That's a long time. I'm going to try to make it to 10 years. That'll be a decade, and then I think we'll have to say, OK, that's enough. Um, we've, it's a before-after, actually a before-after control impact study, like Cause was talking about before. Um, and I've only got one slide on it. I don't want you to think that that's because it wasn't a lot of work. It was a ton, and it is a ton and ton of work. I also want to um, do a shout out to Robin because he has personally identified every single specimen that we have collected, and it's been tens of thousands of specimens that he has identified in the study. Uh, so what we've been looking at is on these very, very intensive, large-scale, conventional farms, what happens if you put in a flowering strip of native plants that are pollinator attractive and that were designed to flower in a sequence? So we have something flowering pretty much all the time between February and October. And here you see the Ceanothus in flower on this particular hedgerow. Uh, and what we found is that, yes, we can enhance the abundance and diversity of native bees. This might not seem surprising, but when you think back to that earlier picture I showed you of that really barren landscape, it wasn't for sure. We didn't know, you know, would we find anything? Would, would things colonize these areas? Um, and, you know, would they be able to survive uh, all that in, intensive <coughs> agricultural landscape? In addition to promoting uh, abundance and diversity of native pollinators, both, uh, I should mention, both bees and also surfeit flies, we find that they actually uh, tend to promote the more specialized pollinators. And this is true, in, again, in the bees and the flies. So we've, what do we mean by more specialized? Well, going back to the pollination networks uh, that Denise talked about, um, I don't know if you can see this, but the one that's circled here is only connected to one flower. So that would be a more specialized bee, as opposed to the other bees that are connected to um, many resources. So we're finding that the more specialized ones are the ones that we're especially able to promote. Um, and in addition, when we look at their nesting habits, and um, I'm not sure how well you can see this, but this is, this is a, um, a megachylid leaf cutting bee carrying a leaf into a cavity. It's not from our site. I wish I had pictures like that. I don't. But um, what we're finding is that bees like this that have more specialized nesting habits that nest in cavities. Um, are the ones that are specially being promoted um, by our hedgerows. And that's really exciting. It means that the hedgerows aren't just promoting the most uh, generalized species or the ones that, are, that we're perhaps not worried about anyway, but they're actually helping to conserve um, some of the species that are more specialized and thus more at risk. The other thing that we found through a lot of complicated data analyses with this long-term data set is that it's not just a transient attraction. It's not just that we produce a lot of blooms and everything is coming to visit that at that moment. We actually can detect a, single, a signal of long-term persistence. We're affecting the persistence of these species, which is really important. That's what we want for conservation. But what about pollination services? Of course, what the growers care about is if I plant this hedgerow, am I going to get more pollinators that are going to pollinate my crops? Am I going to, is it going to pay back, you know, my costs of putting in those hedgerows? So this is a little experiment we did, and it's kind of a strange situation. We, uh, we had a lot of hedgerows that were growing right next to t processing tomato fields, and processing tomato is not a, a crop that benefits from um, animal pollinators. It's pretty much all self-pollinating. So in order to study pollination, uh, the effect of hedgerows on pollination services, we had to put a pollinator dependent crop out into this tomato processing field. So we used canola. We used little pots, potted canola plants. And that's what you see there. Um, and what we found is um, looking at different distances into the field, we found that next to hedgerows, we had much higher abundance and diversity of of pollinators going out into the fields, up to 200 meters into the field. And we could also detect that there were increases in the canola seed set. And through an estimation process, we could uh, detect that that led to 
not, not a huge increase, but a 16% increase in the canola seeds due to native bees. So that's good. But it's a really different situation doing an experiment like this than looking uh, at what you actually have in one of our typical fields. Again, with these mass flowering crops, here's sunflower, which we have a lot of in our region. There are just so many blooms to pollinate, um, so many blooms to be visited. How is the little hedgerow going to, is the little hedgerow going to make a difference for pollination services? And here, uh, we compared a seed set on the sunflower on fields with hedgerows and fields without hedgerows. And there, we did not find any differences between the fields. There could be a number of different reasons for this. One is that just the massive number of flowers dilutes the effect of increases in abundance that are caused by, to native populations of bees that are caused by the hedgerows. Um, another reason could be, and this is what uh, my graduate student, Hilary Sardinias, who's conducting this work, this is her hypothesis, is that really uh, a lot of what you see visiting the sunflower are bees that are, are actually specialists on sunflower or their close relatives. And uh, these bees are not particularly tracking the hedgerow resources, but instead they're very much influenced by where sunflower was grown. Uh, in the current year and also in the previous years. And so this map here shows the distribution of sunflower in our county um, the same year, prior year, and two years past. And what she's finding is that that's the really controlling factor on abundance. So with the hedgerows, it's just important to recognize they can be a really important tool for pollinator conservation. And they might be important also for pollination services, but we can't assume that uh, on their own, they'll always be able to do the job in these very intensive agricultural landscapes. Hedgerows also provide a lot of other benefits. Uh, as I noted before, with um, diversified farming systems, the hedgerows have, um, it's not just pollination, but other kinds of benefits like enhancing biodiversity, um, uh, filter traps, erosion control, windbreaks, and beneficial insects for uh, pest control. So there are other reasons to plant hedgerows too. So it kind of coming back to my diversified farming system, I think that it's a winning concept for sustainable agriculture. Um, as part of a diversified farming system, the hedgerow can be really an, an important element, but it's probably not enough on its own. Um, but from the bee's eye perspective, the diversified farming systems is something that uh, can really permit them to survive and thrive. And um, what's really exciting about what the bees are telling us is that what works for them could solve so many other problems of the industrialized <coughs> agricultural food system. And I want to end there, but before I do, I want to not only thank um, the organizers of the symposium and again um, the, you know, for receiving this award. And I, um, there are many, many colleagues, students, field assistants, and landowners, as well as funding agencies. Too many to fit on the slide, so it kind of took the easy way out here. But I do want to acknowledge so many people have helped with this body of work. Thank you so much. <laughs>